Uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Scott Gowdy, uh, who is somebody I've known for longer than some of you, but not all of you, have been alive uh, since the early 1995. 1995, when he entered graduate school at Ohio State and I was a professor there. Scott uh, was one of the uh, students that I worked with while he was at Ohio State. Um, he seems to have survived that quite well. Uh, or at least acceptably well without too much damage. <laughs> so all of you take some degree of solace in that. It can happen. Uh, Scott is a well-known uh, researcher in exoplanets and in particular doing surveys for exoplanets and trying to uh, find them and characterize them and understand their formation mechanisms, how they came to be, how they're different from our own, our own solar system. It's a very active, uh, exciting part of modern day astronomy. Uh, I will say that Scott finished his PhD at Ohio State in around 2000 or so. Yep. Uh, we were very amused right after that. Discover Magazine named him one of the 20, 20 yeah, scientists right. in the world to watch over the next 20 years. Wow. So, of course, we all watched him for the next 20 years. And that's over about now, it turns out. So, well, it, it's only had accomplished something. In those <laughs> yeah, totally years. Done something. Gosh, Scott has done an incredible amount in those 20 years. He did a, an, an awful lot as a graduate student as well. He helped found the entire field of looking for planets with gravitational microlensing as a graduate student, for example, something that um, uh, I was involved in and, and other professors at Ohio State. He then went on to be a, a really prestigious prize postdoc um, at Harvard and a Hubble Fellow at, at Princeton before returning to Ohio State as a professor um, about the time I left there. So, coincidence? What that, yeah, coincidence? Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Scott has won many awards. He's won a NASA uh, Excellence Award for public service in outstanding public out, leadership. Outstanding public leadership. Thank yeah. you. He also won uh, Mental Fellowship, or sorry, uh, Warner Prize. Warner Prize. Thank you. The WS Warner Prize is one of the most promising um, astronomers in the country, um, young astronomers in the country. Uh, I wrote down a bunch of stuff so I wouldn't forget, totally but fine. Scott remembers it better than I do anyway. That's enough. So that's enough. He's a great guy. <laughs> Scott's a wonderful guy. He's a great researcher. He's done an enormous amount of um, exciting stuff. We're going to hear about some of the upcoming stuff that will make use of a, of a hopefully soon to be uh, developed and launched uh, satellite that will do a lot of really interesting stuff in many fields of astrophysics, but particular exoplanets. So take away, Scott, and here is our standard gift to you for coming in here in person. I'm, okay, I'm afraid. You can, no, don't be afraid, it's fine. <laughs> All right, thank you, thanks, Darren. Um, I don't think this is working. Oh, uh, you no. I looked, I looked for buttons. Oh, there's, yeah, let me try. There's no button. Yeah, see, this is, this is, this oh, takes a true experimental, which is not me. Somebody just showed me how to do it. Just open the battery. Yeah. <laughs> the battery. All right, now, no. Let's see, let's see the batteries are. It's full. It should work. Mm -hmm. Turn up the volume. Bizarro. We do have we do have reinforcements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It says it's on. The battery's full, so I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Is this for people in the room or people online? Both. It's kind of for both, so we can hear you on the recording. You said it's, it's a green? Yep, it's green. Yeah. Can you hear it? Yeah, it's working. Yeah, now oh, it's, it's going. Now All it's right. going. You just have good. to increase the volume a thousand times. So okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks, Darren. Um, I, I like to say that I learned everything I know about astronomy from three people. Um, I learned everything I know about observational astronomy from Darren Depoy. <clears throat> First time I went observing with him, um, he uh, spent about 20 minutes explaining to me how to use a telescope and then went to sleep. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, so thanks. It's, gr it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to indeed ta be talking about the Roman uh, Space Telescope and the applications in particular for um, understanding exoplanets. Okay, so. It's not working. Why is this not working? All right, I might have to do that manually. Oh, there we go. All right, so I'd like to start my talks off with this slide. <clears throat> so um, before in 1995, or at least this is what we tell our undergraduates, um, this was the one planetary system we knew of around a, a normal star. <clears throat> this is, of course, our own solar system. 
um, although I've done a little revisionist history and uh, excluded Pluto. Um, and, you know, if you look at the architecture of our solar system, it's actually uh, quite, quite interesting. So you have four big glorified balls of rock, one of which we happen to be standing on in the very inner part of the solar system. And then, you know, sort of smack dab in the middle, you have a giant uh, a Jupiter, which is a giant ball of hydrogen and helium mostly. Um, and then as you go further out, you um, also have gas and then ice giants that are sort of an ever increasing distance from the sun. And so um, given that we had this one planetary system we knew of for a long time, uh, theories were developed to try to understand how our solar system came to be, and in particular, why we have this architecture. And so if you want to understand planet formation, um, and you believe in a bottom-up scenario, and you think that most planets actually form in a bottom-up scenario, <clears throat> you have to understand the physical processes by which micron-sized dust grains, which uh, actually condense out of the protoplanetary disk, grow by 13 or 14 orders of magnitude in size, or 38 or 41 orders of magnitude in mass to the final mature planets that we see today. And um, as you can imagine, as you traverse those many orders of magnitude in size and mass, the physics that dominates the agglomeration of those uh, particles into ever bigger particles is very, very different. And that's kind of one of the primary challenges of understanding planet formation. But so it's hard. Um, but nevertheless, you know, given a long time, we came up with a theory to explain the architecture of our solar system. And I won't do this justice, but I'll give you a brief uh, summary of how it works. So we think that stars form from uh, molecular clouds, giant molecular clouds in our galaxy, which are mostly hydrogen and helium, with sort of 1% heavier elements. Um, and some part of that, the giant molecular cloud becomes unstable on, on, uh, under its own weight. It collapses. <clears throat> it has to conserve angular momentum. So most of the material ends up in a protoplanetary disk uh, that's originally quite hot. Over time, that protoplanetary disk cools. And as it cools down to ever lower temperatures, uh, solids begin to condense out of that protoplanetary disk. And what solids condense out depends on where you are in the protoplanetary disk. If you're very close to the star, it's generally quite hot. And so um, you can only have things that have very high condensation temperatures, things like iron. And as you go further out, you can start to get silicates condensing out, which will rock. Uh, and then you reach a magic place that's about uh, 3 AU, three times the distance from the Earth from the sun, where um, it becomes cold enough in the mid plane of the disk that you can actually have solid water ice. And the reason why that's important is the two elements in the universe that like to play well with other elements, the two most common elements in the universe that like to play well, uh, well with other elements are hydrogen and oxygen. So the surface density of solids just beyond this ice line jumps by a factor of several. That means you can form bigger planets and you can form them faster just beyond the ice line. And as a result, we think interior of the ice line, um, you only form big balls of rock, as I mentioned, uh, like uh, the terrestrial planets in our solar system. And then beyond the ice line, you can form gas giants because you rapidly accrete sort of 10 Earth masses worth of solid material. Then you sort of uh, quasi hydrostatically accrete gas uh, until the envelope mass is equal to the gaseous envelope mass is equal to the core mass. And then you have runaway collapse akin to genes collapse. Um, and so you form these giant planets. And that runaway growth phase is actually very short. Um, so it would be very unlikely that you'd be uh, caught somewhere in the middle. So you would expect in this picture to have either failed Jupiters, which are what we think our ice giants are, or giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, so not surprisingly, that theory worked very well to explain our one data point. Um, and, uh, and so, um, and actually this guided a lot of uh, searches for exoplanets before they were discovered. Um, but of course, what happened next, we're all pretty familiar with in 1995, um, a planetary a system, a planet called 51 Peg B uh, was discovered. And this is a giant planet of about half the mass of Jupiter, but it's only located a few stellar radii from its parent star. Uh, well interior to the orbit of Mercury if it were in our solar system. And that is very much, uh, very much not predicted by this model because we think the giant planets can only form beyond this ice line. Um, so it was very much of a surprise um, when this giant, when this planet was found. And actually this planet was found um, a few months after I started graduate school at Ohio State. And I distinctly remember getting a conversation with Darren where he didn't believe this was a planet. Um, and so one of the few cases he was wrong. Okay, so, um, so it is indeed a planet, um, and that just shows that our planet formation model, that simple model, is actually incomplete. Uh, not necessarily wrong, but at least incomplete. 
So there's additional physics we need to consider. So these are things like migration. So we do still think that most giant planets form beyond the ice line, but we now know that some subset of them migrate into these very close distances or even intermediate distances. Um, and now that we're looking at planets around stars with a variety of masses, not just the mass of the sun, we have to end different elemental abundances in the photosphere. So they're just made with different uh, abundances of elements. Uh, we have to ask how that might influence planet formation as well. Um, we have to worry about, because we have these planets very close to their parent stars, we have to worry about things like tides, et cetera. And of course, there could be an entire other ways of forming planets, like a top-down planet formation scenario, that there's increasing evidence now that at least some subset of giant planets actually form in a top-down way. <clears throat> okay, so how do we go about trying to really understand planet formation and understand these physical processes? So the basic idea is that, is that you hope um, or uh, you propose that the physical processes at work as you cross through these orders of magnitude get imprinted in the final distribution of planet properties. And so by understanding the distribution of the properties of the planets, we can hope to actually understand the physics at work in assembling these planets. And so just as an example, because that um, accretion, rapid accretion phase for giant planets is so sh short-lived, it's very unlikely that you're going to get caught in the middle of it. And so either you would have failed Jupiters or Jupiter-sized planets, and you would expect a, a desert or a paucity of planets with mass between roughly 20 Earth masses and the mass of Saturn or Jupiter. Um, now, around low-mass stars, uh, roughly 0.5 to 10% uh, the mass of the Sun, uh, the protoplanetary disks are also smaller and less massive. Um, and the dynamical times where you form giant planets are actually lower or longer, and so we think that it's actually very difficult to actually uh, 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 form a planet massive enough to actually go through this one with gas phase. So there's a natural prediction that giant planets should be relatively rare around low mass stars. Also, because we now know that at least some sorts of planetary systems, the uh, formation and evolution is very dynamically chaotic, you actually are, expect to eject a large number of planets from planetary systems, <clears throat> um, masses anywhere from the mass of Mars to a few, uh, few Jupiter masses. Um, and so if we can detect free floating planets, we can get a handle on how dynamically active planet formation and evolution is. So the plan is that we wanna measure the distribution of function of planet properties, their bulk properties like mass, period, radius, uh, semi-major axis, um, and then uh, over a wide range of planet and host star properties as possible, look for features in those distributions, which we then can map to the physics of what's going on in, in, for like these examples. Um, and so I like to call this measuring the, uh, the demographics of exoplanets. Okay, so these are the tools that we have at our disposal to detect uh, exoplanets. Um, there's the uh, common radial velocity or Doppler method where you're, um, because the planet, the star is actually orbiting the center of mass of the planet star system. As the uh, planet orbits, the star orbits a smaller uh, circle and uh, you can watch the star coming towards you and away from you and measure the Doppler shift. Um, you can also, if the planet happens to have an orientation such that it passes in front of your line of sight, then it'll block the light from that star. And so you can see periodic dimming of the, of the host star. And that's again, the indication of a planet. Um, you have, you know, of course, uh, stars also wobble on the sky because they're orbiting the center of mass. And so if you can measure the precise position of the star on the sky, then you can infer the existence of a planet. And of course, the most straightforward way is to just directly image the planet. In other words, get light photons from the planet that are resolved from the host star. And this is um, probably the most famous directly imaged exoplanet system, which contains four giant planets around uh, a relatively massive star. And, um, and then microlensing, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. And there's a lot of other methods, but they tend to be only uh, uh, applicable to a certain subset of planetary systems. So they're not as good for determining these demographics over broad regions of parameter space. Okay, so this is the um, sort of canonical plot that you always show when you're talking about demographics of exoplanets. Um, so this is planet mass um, or minimum mass and Earth masses as a function of orbital period for the known exoplanets. And we now have almost 5,000 confirmed exoplanets um, just since 1995, which is pretty amazing. Um, and this is showing uh, the similar plot, but this is planet radius as a function of orbital period. And the dots of these uh, known planets are color coded by the detection method or survey. <clears throat> and you can see features in this, these distributions, like I mentioned, some of these are real, 
Some of them are not. Um, you can see this planets in our solar system on this plot. And the thing that you really notice here that's quite striking is that there's this vast region in the bottom right corner of both uh, plots where there's basically no planets that we that we've detected around other stars or very few. And th that region is actually where most of the planets in our solar system live. So the planets in our solar system occupy a region of parameter space that's by and large disjoint from what we can detect with other planets, other methods. Um, and, you know, of course, it's not that there's no planets there, it's just that there we're not sensitive to them. And then there's some exceptions. You can see these cyan triangles. Those are planets detected by microlensing, which, as I'll argue, is actually intrinsically sensitive to planets in these cold outer regions of planetary systems. Okay, so the way microlensing works is relatively simple. Um, say you're looking at a star uh, in the sky. In this case, we're looking at a star in the very center of our galaxy. Um, and if you stare at that star long enough, uh, and I'll get to what long enough means here in a second, another star that's unrelated to that background star, it's in the either foreground galactic bulge or the foreground galactic disk, passes very close to your line of sight to that background star. Very close here being about a milli arc second. When that happens, so you require a very precise alignment. When that happens, the gravity of this foreground lens star will actually bend light that would have been going in this direction from the source star into your line of sight. So here's the observer, here's the source star, here's the lens. We're looking at a side view. Okay. And so what we see is an image of the source that's displaced from the location of the actual source. Now, uh, that's, that was a side view. Now we're looking at the view from the sky, a uh, simplified cartoon of that. The red circle is the source star. The black circle is the lens star, and here I'm showing them perfectly aligned on the left. And then the blue is the actually image of the background source star lensed by the foreground star. And you can see if they're perfectly aligned, you get a ring, uh, and that ring has an angular radius uh, called the angular Einstein ring radius. And it's a combination of uh, the mass of the lens and the relative distances between the lens and the source. Um, and it's about a milli arc second or a few hundred micro arc seconds for a, a typical lens, which is about a half solar mass, located about halfway the distance from here to the center of our galaxy. That's a typical geometry. Um, and if the source is not perfectly aligned, you get two images. Um, and uh, those images are roughly separated by twice the angular Einstein ring radius. And so those are separated by a few milli arc seconds, which we basically can't resolve. We've only resolved it for a few microlensing events um, and, that, and then only very recently. Um, but what we can measure is the total magnification of the source, which is the area of the images divided by the area of the source. And that magnification can actually be quite large, uh, factors of 100. Okay, so that's a static case, but of course the lens, the uh, us and the source are all moving in the gravitational potential of the galaxy. And so that we see something that's a function of time. So here, just for simplicity, I fixed the lens at the origin and I'm moving the source behind it. Um, because really all we care about is the relative motion of these two. And you can see as the source moves behind the lens that you get these two images um, and they trace out these shaded paths here. And you can see the sizes of these images change and therefore the magnification changes. And so you get this smooth symmetric microlensing event, uh, which peaks when you have the closest alignment between the lens and the source. And this has a characteristic analytic form that you can just write down and it's very easy to draw. And now the time scale of these microlensing events is basically the time it takes for the source to cross the Einstein ring radius of the lens. So it's equal to the angular Einstein ring radius divided by the relative proper motion, which I'm calling here mu, between the lens and source. So just the relative angular uh, velocity on the sky. Um, and so that's about 25 days for, again, for a typical system uh, case. But the, the proper motions range from uh, over a factor of 10 uh, and the angular Einstein ring ray also vary over a factor of 10. So you can get microlensing events from time scales of a few days up to a few hundred days. The important thing to recognize is that you can't predict when a lens is going to approach a source in general. So these events are stochastic and unpredictable. Um, and I said that you have to look for a long time to see a microlensing micro event on a given source. A long time here is about 100,000 years for a given uh, source of a in the, uh, towards the galactic bulge, <clears throat> which is sufficiently longer than a graduate student lifetime, but it's not a very good experiment. So you, you need to look at hundreds of millions of sources to see one that's being lensed or a thousand being lensed at a given time. 
And that generally means you need to look at crowded fields and use large format detectors to detect the brightness of, our, of these all those stars. An important thing to recognize is that this is the main thing you measure from a microlensing event, this time scale. And you can see that because it depends on the angular Einstein ring radius and the proper motions, which depend on the velocities and distances, um, this is a degenerate combination of the mass distance to lens and the source and these relative uh, angular speed and the sky. Okay, so what does this all have to do with planets? If your foreground star, and again, this is the foreground star we're talking about here, happens to have a planet orbiting it, and that planet happens to be located in the path of one of these images created by the, the, the host star lens, then as the image sweeps by it, uh, the, the gravity of that planet will perturb the light from that background, from that image, and you'll get an extra little deviation on top of your otherwise smooth and symmetric event. <clears throat> and the time scale for that deviation is roughly just the time to take across the angular Einstein ring radius of the planet. Um, so it, it is this basically proportional to the square root of the mass ratio between the planet and its host star. Um, and that's about a one day for a Jupiter mass planet and it's goes down to about a few hours for an Earth mass planet orbiting a sun-like star. Now, these images have um, largest area when they're close to the Einstein ring, which you can see here, which means that your efficiency is maximized when the planet is close to the Einstein ring. And that Einstein ring, where these images pass that foreground lens, happens to be located at a few AU, or a few times the distance of the Earth from the sun, from in their parent systems. And that scales pretty weakly with, um, with, this, with the mass of the lens. And so as a result, microlensing is inherently sensitive to planets that are located sort of in the outskirts of planetary systems, roughly where our own Jupiter and Saturn are in our own systems, making it very complementary to the other techniques, which are sensitive to generally short period planets or um, uh, in particular massive short period planets. Okay. Now, one th important thing is that we are not using light from the, the lens or the planet to detect the planet or the, the host star, just the gravity. So that means that um, we're sensitive to planetary systems that's essentially arbitrary distances, anywhere from here to that source star, which is located in the center of our galaxy. Um, and we are also sensitive to, of course, we can detect planets that are close to the Einstein ring. We can also detect planets that are far from the Einstein ring if they happen to be located in the path of this image here. But we can't detect planets that are very close to the Einstein ring because they're perturbing images that are highly demagnified. And so that deviation is very small. Okay. Now, planets even not bound to their host star have gravity. And so they can act like isolated microlenses. Uh, um, it's just that their time scale for the, their microlensing events are much shorter. So microlensing is sensitive to free-floating planets actually down to very low masses. This is a candidate free-floating several Earth mass planet uh, discovered by the Ogle and K and TNET collaborations. Um, and so, um, and like I said, these are a generic prediction of, of dynamical evolution of planetary systems. More massive free-floating planets can also probably form like stars. Um, so we expect these to be quite common. Um, and you can see a bunch of papers here, including you might recognize the name there, Exploring the detectability of these free floating planets using microlenses. All right. Oh, yeah. And just, just for the physicists in the room, I said, oh, I didn't need to do that. I, I don't know if everyone knows this, but you know, the most obnoxious unit in astronomy, although I'll defend it to my death, partially thanks to Darren, is the magnitude. So that's just related to the flux. One magnitude is about 2.5 times flux, the, the change in the flux. And that's just time. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and then um, in terms of the planet mass, it, very interestingly, microlensing is not sensitive to the, the, the magnitude of the perturbation is not sensitive to the planet mass. It's sensitive to how close the planet is to the image that it's perturbing. So in principle, you can get arbitrarily large perturbations from arbitrarily small planets. And I'm showing that here where I just have a planet where I'm not changing its position, but I'm shrinking its mass. And you can see that you get very large deviation perturbations, but they shrink in duration and they're also become rarer. So you can detect very low mass planets and the signal magnitude is independent of the planet mass, but the signals get rarer and briefer. And the detection probability for an Earth around a sun-like star is about a few percent if it's located near the Einstein ring radius. 
And the perturbations, again, can be quite short for a fast product. Now, of course, there has to be a limit to that. Um, a dust grain is not going to give you an arbitrarily large deviation. And so the way this breaks down is when the angular size of your source is actually bigger than the angular size of your planetary Einstein ring radius, because then you're just magnifying a small part of the source. And so your perturbation gets washed out. And so this shows the perturbation to an Earth mass planet for sources, uh, a typical population of sources in the bulge. This is a source uh, in the main sequence, hydrogen burning uh, star. And this is a giant source that has actually left the main sequence, is now fusing hydrogen into helium. But in those stars are much bigger, or helium in the heavier elements, which is much, and that source is much bigger. Um, so this limit is saturated roughly when the, the, um, these two are equal. Um, and so that, and that happens for roughly an Earth mass planet orbiting a sun like star and a sun like star located in the center of our galaxy. And so if you can monitor um, the sun like stars in the center of our galaxy, you can detect planets with mass of the Earth or even lower. In fact, the lower limit you can show is roughly a few lunar masses, making it exquisitely sensitive to low mass planets. And then finally, in terms of the host stars that you're looking for planets around, basically anything that happens to float along your line of sight to those more background, those more distant background stars can serve as hosts that you look for planets around. And so if you just ask what is in the galaxy between us and its center, you have uh, hydrogen fusing stars with mass less than that of roughly the sun and the bulge. You have brown dwarfs or failed stars with mass roughly less than roughly 80 times the mass of Jupiter. You have remnants, so the leftovers of uh, after planets die or stars die, so white dwarfs, black holes, and neutron stars. And so you don't just look for planets around low mass stars, which is a common mis misconception by people that, that know something about this method. Um, okay. All right, and just to show that I'm not making this up, this is actually sort of prettified data of the first microlensing planet that was discovered. You can see the crowded field towards the bulge. You can see the star here getting brighter and fainter, and then it periodically gets much brighter, and that's due to the planet. Okay, so this actually happens. So in terms of the sensitivity to exoplanetary systems, uh, it's sensitive to planets beyond this snow line or ice line, um, and that makes it, again, complementary to other techniques. Uh, very low mass planets up down to very roughly 10% of the mass of Mars or roughly twice the mass of the moon. Um, long period planets, including analogs to our own Ju uh, Uranus and Neptune. A wide range of host star masses, as I just discussed. Um, free floating planets. Uh, you can detect giant moons, so you can detect Earth moon analogs uh, with, with, uh, with a sufficiently uh, sensitive experiment. You can, of course, detect multi-planet systems analogs of our own giant planet system. Wide circumbinary planets, so planets where they, the planet orbits both stars of a binary. Uh, outer planet, planets in the outer habitable zone of their uh, host stars, the outer Goldilocks zone, and as I mentioned, planets throughout the galaxy. And in particular, you can try to probe planet demographics as a function of the, the population of stars that the, the, the planet lives in, either in the galactic bulge or the galactic disk, which we think had very different formation histories and those formation histories might actually affect how planets form and again give us another handle on planet formation. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about a few results that we've learned from demographics of microlensing from ground based surveys before turning my attention to, um, to the Roman Galactic Space Telescope. Okay, so one of the first results of uh, microlensing surveys from the ground for planets was the discovery of a population of uh, low mass cold planets, low mass being here super Earths or sub-Neptunes, right actually in that place where we think there should have been a desert in planets. Uh, we, found, we found a large population of such planets. Um, and you can see, this is the kind of poster child of that. You can see this is the data points are shown here. The solid is the model. You can see the background star getting brighter and fainter in that nice smooth symmetric way. But then there's this little blip and that's due to the planet perturbing that image as it sweeps by. All right, so this is somewhat of a busy plot, but um, for now, let's just focus on the gray shaded area. This is actually from a sample of planets, a well-selected sample of planets, <clears throat> the recovered mass ratio function. So the distribution of mass ratios of cold planets detected by ground-based microlensing. And you can see that the mass function is very steep as you go to high mass objects, it drops very precipitously, um, but it is consistent with the power law in the regime of mass ratios from roughly 10 that times that of Jupiter to the sun to roughly Neptune to the sun. 
that's up here is that's the peak. Um, and then below that, there is maybe a fall off towards short and lower masses, or maybe a plateau, or maybe even a pileup. We don't know because it's actually very hard to detect planets with mass lower than that of the Earth from the ground uh, for reasons I'll talk about. And I mentioned that, you know, we've discovered this large population of super Earths or sub Neptunes exactly where the planet formation models predict they shouldn't be any planets or there should be a paucity of planets. And so this is that red is actually the same observed distribution of planet mass ratios. Um, and then these shaded histograms <clears throat> are the results from ab initio planet formation models. And what you can see is that there's um, these ab initio planet formation models generally predict a paucity of planets in this regime, which is not seen in the data, telling us something about um, how this model of giant planet formation is incomplete. Okay. So meanwhile, in, well, we discovered, you know, a few hundred, a little bit over a hundred planets with microlensing, um, we have all these other planets discovered by other techniques, and we still have this paucity, this sort of gap in our knowledge, which we'd like to fill in, which turns out to be very hard to fill in from the ground. Okay, and so just to put this in perspective, um, this is a, you know, a view of our top down view of our solar system uh, with the planet, the giant planets labeled here. I've included Pluto because it makes my argument better. Um, and then interior to here is where this, the terrestrial planets are. And that little red circle is where the Kepler sense, uh, survey was sensitive to. So Kepler was a mission designed to find uh, planets using the transit technique and is the first large statistical um, survey for planets that we've, exoplanets that we've had carried out. And there's been a lot of results from the Kepler that, pe Kepler that people talk about. And they sort of broadly apply these to planetary systems in general. But you can see here that the subset of planetary systems they're sensitive to is really just a small fraction of where the planets live in our solar system. Um, okay, so how do we complete the statistical census of exoplanets? In particular, how do we fill in that bottom right corner of those two parameters? And so we can do this with um, we can do this for, with microlensing. Um, and so, but first, you know, let's formulate why we want to do that. So. Um, so one, we think that, as I've argued, planet formation is thought to be more efficient beyond the nice snow line or ice line. Um, and we still think that this is probably where most giant planets form. Um, and we really want to survey a broad range of masses uh, for these cold systems because we want to see how they grow from the embryos that sort of uh, first uh, agglomerate from the solid material <clears throat> up to the giant planets we see today. Um, again, so we can probe that physics that changes as we cross those orders of magnitude and mass and radius. Um, and one interesting thing that I just want to emphasize is that there's this apparent paradox for potentially habitable planets. So there's a region, you know, around stars where you can have liquid water be stable on the surface of a rocky planet with a thin atmosphere. That's called the habitable zone. But planets that form in that region uh, a distance from their host stars are almost certainly dry because that region is interior to where the ice line is during most giant, most planet formation, uh, where most of the terrestrial planets are, when most of the terrestrial planets are formed. So that means that it's almost certainly the case that all of the water from the Earth, for example, came from beyond the snow line. And we think maybe that comes from a water rich asteroids or comets, we don't really know. Uh, but nevertheless, something has to be dynamically active. Uh, activating these comets and, and asteroids and throwing them into the inner part of the solar system so that they can populate the Earth with water. So if we really want to understand water habitability, which we uh, when we think water is essential for that, we really have to understand what's going on in the outer regions of planetary systems. Okay, so those are all, I think, pretty good reasons. I don't think it's the real reason we should do this. The real reason we should do this is because of this. Okay. We had this great model for how planets should form, and we were just wrong. Um, and if I've learned anything in working on exoplanets for 20 plus years, it's that every time we think we know something, we turn out to be wrong. Um, and I like to say that Mother Nature is more imaginative than we are. So we should just go out there and look. All right, so let's set as our baseline. You know, so how do we design an experiment to do this, complete the census? Let's say we want to detect a large number of Earth mass planets beyond the snow line, say 100. Um, how do we do that? Well, the requirements are here. Um, so again, the, the, the event rate, uh, the probability that any given star is being lensed is about uh, 10 to the minus five per year per star. Um, so you, um, and then the detection probability, if you have an Earth in the right place is about 1%. Uh, 
the shortest features are about 30 minutes, and then you don't know when these perturbations are going to happen um, for the planet or even the micro lens of event itself. So the net result is you have to monitor hundreds of millions of stars in the galactic bulge continuously on a time scale of 10 minutes per year. The first time I wrote this down about 10 years ago, I was like, this is never going to happen. But actually, this is exactly what the Roman Space Telescope can do. Um, <clears throat> now, the nice thing is that these perturbations are large, so you don't need very good uh, relative photometry. You don't need to measure the flux as a function of time of this star very precisely, just a few percent to 10 percent. Whereas with for transiting Earth-like planets, you have to measure it to one part in 10 to the five. Um, you need to resolve the main sequence sources because those are the smallest sources that allow us to detect the smallest planets, as I argued. Um, I'll skip that because it's a little bit of a detail. Um, and so um, the net result of all these requirements is you can't do this from the ground. So you need to go to space and you wanna to go to space because you wanna go into the near infrared, like roughly one to two microns, because uh, on the ground, the sky is very bright in the near infrared on the space, not so bright. Um, and uh, that allows you to go more extinct in fields that have a lot of a lot more dust attenuation in them. Um, and those have a higher event rate. So you get more microlensing events, more planets. You can also, of course, low mass stars put out more light in the near infrared. So you can get better photon counting statistics on those low mass stars, which are the small sources will enable you to detect the smallest planets. Um, you wanna be able to resolve all the main sequence sources. So you can just see how much of a problem this is. This is a simulation of the center of our galaxy in one of the fields that we would be looking at with Roman from the Roman Space Telescope and from the ground. Um, you know, these, these th for the astronomers in the room, this is 10 arc seconds, just to give you a sense. This is 10 arc seconds here. And you can see that all of these, the, all of these individual stars that you might think, all of these individual sources that you might think are individual stars are actually just asterisms of main sequence sources in the bulge. So you really need resolutions of less than sort of 0.2 arc seconds to do this. So then, therefore, you need to have a relatively large telescope and you need to go to space. Um, and then um, because you need the field of view as well, so it's hard to do large fields of view at high angular resolution from the ground. Um, you need the visibility to get complete coverage of the perturbations because you don't know when they're going to happen. Um, and of course, if you go to space, the hope is that you have much smaller systematics. And the science we think is enabled from space is sub-Earth mass planets, outer habitable zone planets, free-floating Earth mass planets, and mass measurements, routine mass measurements of the host and this planet. So writing that all down, what kind of hardware do you need? Well, you need a large, greater than one meter space telescope uh, in the near infrared with relatively large field of view, capable of continuous observations on 15 minute cadence for long periods of time over long time baselines. And that actually turns out to be exactly what the Roman Space Telescope is, not coincidentally. All right, so now the last part of my talk, let me talk about the Roman Space Telescope and what it's capable of. So um, it's the Nancy, Gross, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Nancy Grace Roman was um, often called the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope. She was one of uh, the first NASA uh, si chief scientists, uh, the first female uh, uh, in NASA with a you know, very high ranking position. Um, and, uh, and we're very honored to have the Space Telescope be named after her. Um, and so there's a little bit of a tortured history, which is kind of fun to talk about for Roman. Um, it was the long, number one recommendation of the Astro 2010 Decadal Survey for a large space mission. So if you're not familiar, every 10 years, astronomers get together, as a, as a U.S. astronomers get together and decide what they're going to do for the next 10 years. They make, prior, uh, uh, they make recommendations and priorities, and these are taken very seriously by the National, uh, National Science Foundation and NASA and also, also DOE. Um, and we just recently had the Astro 2020, which uh, Rob Kennecott was one of the uh, co-chairs of the steering committee for that. But in, uh, in 2010, uh, the Decadal Survey prioritized um, Roman, actually at the time it was called W first. And this was a notional mission based on several different input uh, mission concepts. One was a dark energy mission called JDM Omega. One was the microlensing uh, planet finder uh, along the lines of what I just mentioned. And one was a near infrared sky survey. And so the steering committee imagined that this telescope, because the, these three science applications needed very similar kinds of hardware. They needed a, you know, a sort of one meter space telescope uh, with a relatively large field of view and it needed to go in the infrared. So they said, oh, well, instead of doing three different telescopes, let's just do it all with one. Um, and, they had, and they envisioned three different science areas. Again, a dark energy, 
where you would measure the uh, equation of state of dark energy and its evolution with time uh, using supernova, weak lensing, and baryon acoustic oscillations, an exoplanet microlensing survey, and a geo program. And these, these surveys here were envisioned to be large chunks of time, years or, or, or over a year to several years. Okay, so the Roman went through several designs immediately after it was prioritized by the 2010 Decadal Survey. NASA set up science definition teams, and I was involved in that from the beginning, to kind of come up with a mission that could actually do all this science with a reasonable kind of hardware to make sure that the mission design actually closed. And so we came up with two mission designs for relatively diminutive apertures. Um, and then things kind of stagnated for a while um, until, um, until NASA announced that they had been donated two space qualified 2.4 meter telescopes um, and by another agency of the government. Now, we're not allowed to say what that other agency is. Um, you can Google it if you want, but we're not allowed to say it. Um, I'll give you a hint, though. When NASA was given these telescopes, it was told they could do anything with them except point them at the Earth. Um, so, so the idea was, well, hey, maybe we can use one of these for W first. It's, it's bigger, maybe it's better. Um, and that's indeed what was what happened. And that kind of kind of reinvigorated W first um, and ultimately led to Roman. Um, and I won't have time to talk about the chronograph, but it's also of interest. Um, okay, so this is where we are now. This is more or less the final design of Roman. And so one thing I want to emphasize is this is not a notional mission. This is not something that we're just still you know, kind of thinking about and scrawling on blackboards. This is a real thing. Hardware is being built as we speak. The launch date is, you know, four to five years from now. Um, so it's a 2.28 meter aperture, effective aperture, field of view, which is large by space standards, but not super large, 0.3 square degrees. Uh, wavelengths from sort of the middle of the optical down to, to, to two microns and full width half max of about 0.1 arc seconds, diffraction limited. Um, again, orbit launches 2026, hopefully no later than May 2027. Mission lifetime is five years with a hope to be able to go to 10 years or longer. And um, Roman will be at L2, which is where JWST is now. It's a nice, quiet environment that gives you uh, long looks at parts of the sky without worrying about the Earth or the moon getting in the way. Okay, um, so these are the, the, the wide field instrument has uh, eight filters, which you can see here. There's the wavelength range and the effective area. Um, also has a, uh, and one of these filters is a wide filter used by the microlensing that goes from one to two microns. There's also a grism and a prism. Um, the, there's, and there's lots of different things you could do with this um, that I don't really have time to do to talk about, um, including all the great dark energy work you could do. Um, and the field of view is quite large. It's about 100 times the largest detectors on HST or JWST. So we like to call it 100 Hubbles for the 2020s. Uh, all right, so this, uh, this mission became official in 2016 and had a new start called KDPA from NASA Speak. Um, and we had, they solicited proposals for science investigation teams. The previous administration tried to cancel it, but failed, thank God. Um, and it's now it was fully funded in the FY22 budget. And the important thing is we're now in what's called phase C, and that means we're actually building hardware. Things are getting soldered together. The primary mirror has been polished and coated, um, refigured, polished, and coated. Uh, the, uh, the detectors have, have been collected. We have all the detectors we need. We know they pass our specifications. Um, the filters are in hand. Things are getting integrated. You know, this is a real mission that's actually happening. And just to show you that this is actually a mosaic of the, the, the detectors, um, which are gonna go into the, the ultimate mosaic of the wide field instrument, which is 18 H4RG detectors for the Cognizetti. Um, and each one of these rows is showing a different um, uh, attribute of the detector. So like persistence or dark noise or those kinds of things. Um, and so you can see each detector has its own personality. Um, this figure looks kind of terrible, but actually all of these detectors meet specifications well within margin. Uh, so these are actually exquisite detectors. It's pretty impressive. Um, and so we have them and they're, and they're working. All right, so what are we gonna get from microlensing? So we did a bunch of simulations to try to optimize the survey and predict the yield. When I say we, I mean Matthew Penny. So postdoc was working with me now as an assistant professor at Louisiana State University. Um, so we come up with a galactic model that predicts where the sources and lenses are and the extinction and all that good stuff. We put down some uh, proposed fields. We simulate scenes of those fields of stars. 
Again, based on known properties of the galaxy, we inject microlensing events, we look for the microlensing events, and then we look for the planetary perturbations on top of them. And then we can optimize that to maximize the yield of planets. And so this is what we came up with. It's seven fields of, for a total of two square degrees, 15 minute cadence, um, uh, six 72 day seasons. The total amount of observing time is 432 days. This is gonna be one of the deepest, if not the deepest image of the sky ever taken once it's done. Uh, which is pretty impressive. Of course, it's going to be confusion limited, so you know I can't boast about that too much, but still pretty impressive. 41,000 exposures in the wide filter. So if you can actually beat down uh, the statistics by root n, and that's a big if, then you can improve everything by a factor of 20, 200 over individual measurements. So just to show you some simulated detections, I showed this before. This is a Ganymede mass object orbiting at roughly the distance of Jupiter from the sun around a star that's roughly one third the mass of the sun. This deviation is 27 sigma, it is not subtle. Uh, this is a free floating Mars, 23 sigma. So these are very, very strong deviations. And we think that there's no real false positives uh, that can mimic these kinds of deviations. So in terms of the yields, these are all made up, of course, because if we knew this, we wouldn't actually be doing the survey, but just to give you a sense that those large numbers involved, we sort of predict about 1500 total planets of which you know about 200 are mass of the Earth or less, and then roughly 250 free-floating planets, of which you know 50 are the mass of the Earth or less to 60. So that means that we're going to have a sample that's not quite as large as Kepler, which is you know sort of a few 2,300 planets, but large enough that we can start chopping it up into different parts of parameter space and really kind of learn measure these demographics, uh, these demographic functions, which allow us to again search for features indicative of planet formation. So this is a plot, which I, I personally find very striking. I call it the Penny plot because it was made by Matthew Penny. It shows the sensitivity of the Kepler survey here as a function of planet mass and semi-major axis. Um, and these are the detections with Kepler. And then this is the sensitivity of Roman with that notional survey I mentioned. And these blue points are you know, predicted detections. Again, don't believe them. Just to show you, there's a lots of blue dots there. And these are the giant, these are the planets in our solar system as well as a few giant moons thrown in for good measure. And you can see that um, together, Kepler and Roman is sensitive to uh, any planet with mass or radius greater than that of the Earth and separation between zero and infinity because we're sensitive to free floating planets, um, analogs to all the solar system planets except for Mercury and even to giant moons. And so together, these will complete the statistical census more or less of exoplanets. All right, and then just to show you in this completely unfair comparison, this is where Roman will be. Okay. Um, all right, so the rest of my time, I'm just gonna, so that's what you can do for exoplanets. And I'm just gonna finally finish off a few slides to try to get people to think about what they might do with this survey or how they might tweak this survey to get even more science. Even if you don't care about exoplanets, there's lots of things you can do. So again, the statistical power of the survey is incredible. Uh, you know, we're going to get like a billion photons uh, of a sort of typical uh, magnitude star in this survey. Um, and so, you know, again, you can root things down by 200 if you can get the statistical precision. And for um, and we're going to have a ton of stars. So down to sort of the faintest stars we think we can detect, there's going to be 300 million of them in those fields. There's going to be 30,000 microlensing events. And um, and the single measure, measurement precision is like a few a per percent in terms of photometry, a, a milliarc second in terms of astrometry. And again, if you can beat that down, uh, capture the full statistical power, you can decrease those things by a factor of 200. So there's lots of things you can do. And this is just a subset of things that people have thought about. So I'll just, so this is the physics department. I'll mention one thing, which I think is super exciting, which is that with microlensing, as I mentioned, um, anything that floats along your line of sight can cause microlensing events. And that means that isolated black holes will cause microlensing events. And there is no way that we have to detect isolated black holes, at least now, except for with gravitational microlensing. Roman will detect hundreds of isolated black holes, measure their masses and distances. So you can measure, and you know, neutron stars as well. So you can measure the mass function of remnants, of isolated remnants, um, and, you know, binaries if they're there in relatively close separations. And you can look for things like the predicted mass gap between neutron stars and black holes. Black hole mass function is predicted to have all sorts of weird features, uh, depending on exactly the mass of the progenitor, 
those kinds of things you can start to tease out with this survey. And again, this is all going to come for free with no alter alteration of the survey at all. And it's important to emphasize that very recently, the first isolated black hole or maybe neutron star was detected and confirmed with microlensing using ground-based, but it was an arduous process. And now you can do it, in, you know, you can just churn these out in factory level production um, with Roman. You know, you'll detect 100,000 transiting planets if you care about that, um, you know. <laughs> I won't even go into this. Um, okay, so the other thing is I want people to think about because you know I mentioned this notional service but survey, but that is notional. We really want input from the community so that they can help us tweak the survey to optimize the science, even if it means getting slightly less exoplanets. Maybe we can do better science. And so one thing I'll just mention is um, is you know the optimal survey is seven fields um, where you cycle between those uh, that optimizes the yield of Earth-like planets. But let's say every once in a while, after we go through like 10 cycles of this, we cycle a much larger area. Well, we wouldn't be sensitive to planets in that much larger area, but we would be sensitive to general microlensing events. In particular, microlensing events due to massive objects like black holes. So maybe we can increase that sample of 100 or hundreds of isolated black holes that we have massive distance measurements to, to 1,000, and then you can do even more. Uh, and so that's one thing that you know needs to be thought about and how that would interface between the requirements of the of the exoplanet survey. And of course, you can imagine extensions as well um, that may or may not be directly related to the survey. Uh, the power of this 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 machine is quite impressive. You know, Roman is not just a it's not just a good survey machine because it has a large field of view. It also has a very high efficiency, very slow, a short, slew and settle times. And, um, and it can look at fields for a very, very long time. So it's really optimized to be a survey machine. And I encourage people to think about how they might use that um, going forward, because there's going to be opportunity very soon by the end of this year to propose to be parts of teams to help define these kinds of surveys. All right, I'll just leave my summary up there. I don't know how much time I have and let take questions. Thank you, Scott. Oh, there, are there any the questions? Question. Good. Do I need the mic? Just get So, so I just have a question about. Kepler. I can just repeat the question. Yeah, yeah. Repeat the question. I have a question about Kepler, which I've always had. Yep. Never really understood. Like, so the super Earths. I guess it's a two-part question. The, the statement. Tell me if this is correct or not. The statement is that super Earths are the most um, common type of planet that detects yeah. Kepler. Correct. And the statement that I always hear that I never really understood is that's not a selection effect. Oh, so so yeah, I just want your comments about right. so our super Earth most right. type of our, our, so type of objects in the universe. The comment you hear from Kepler is that the, as a result of Kepler, we now know that super Earths of mini Neptune sort of are the most common planet exoplanet. And of course, so there's two parts of that. So the, there is that statement is definitely true for the for the region of parameter space. Where Rome, where Kepler was sensitive, which is sort of within one AU, and planets with mass or radius greater than roughly that of the Earth. Okay, um, so in that region of parameter space, that is definitely true. However, people generally extend that further, um, and what they mean by that is you can just, of course, ask how many, what fraction of stars host those kinds of systems, and that's most stars. So even if all the rest of the stars looked like our own solar system, it would still be the case. That those planets couldn't be as common. I think that's what people mean. Now you can imagine different things. Like let's say that Mars mass things are even more common than that. That could totally be possible, and then that statement would no longer be true. So there's definitely caveats to that that statement. Okay. I'm still a little bit confused, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. It's just that you know what fraction, how many star, what fraction of stars host these things. Yeah. So even if you put all of your planets, a bunch of planets, in the other ones. You can't make up for that frequency. Yep. Well, well, will you be sensitive to different parameter space for the transiting exoplanets? Yes, of course. So transit is naturally sensitive to big, short period planets. So, um, no, sorry. Will your transit exoplanet population be different from Kepler? Will we have a longer base? Oh, or no, no. Well, mostly no. Um, because we don't have the sensitivity to small small planets that Kepler does, um, and um, you know we have we, we can 
and we're not looking at four years, which is what Kepler was. So, so generally, no, we're looking at a subset of the region of parameter space of Kepler. But I would say two things. One, our sample size is you know orders of magnitude larger than what Kepler is going to find. So that might be interesting, especially if there's oddballs. And we're going to find, okay, this is kind of crazy, but we're going to find transiting planets with periods of up to 30 years by just finding one single transit that has a signal to noise of like a gazillion in the data. So it's going to last like a day the transit because it's at 30 years, right? And so you just see this one transit. And if you can prove that that's due to a transiting planet, you can actually probe the demographics of 30 year period giant planets, which actually then overlaps the microlensing sample as well. So in principle, you might be able to ask whether or not the transiting planets and the microlensing planets are consistent in terms of the demographics. Cool. You may ask online if anyone has a question. Uh, I don't see any, but okay. I don't know if they can hear us. Yeah, uh, Peter. Peter has a question. What is the timing of the galactic survey versus the extragalactic supernova surveys? Is this all going to be done in one chunk and then do the extragalactic or interweave? Or right. So I forgot to mention this. Thank you. So what is the timing of the galactic bulge time domain survey versus the high galactic high latitude surveys, the time domain and wide area survey? Um, you. So I forgot to mention this, but Roman's field of regard is such that because of the location of the sun shield. You can only look at the galactic bulge for set two 72 day seasons located around vernal and autumnal equinox. Um, and so our plan is, to, and there's um, there's 10 such seasons in the prime mission. Our plan is to use six of them, three of them in the early part and three of them in the, la in the later part so we can measure the, the proper motions of, this, of, the, of the stars. Um, but uh, but we, don't, we don't really clash with any of the other surveys per se because the bulge is not is in the plane and you know those are complementary regions of the sky um there i think the supernova my understanding is that the supernova group would wouldn't wouldn't hate if they could get occasional observations during the bulge season and you know that's something that we're open to considering of course so nick, nick had a question online yeah so you may you may actually so scott you may actually invite nick to answer this question and see if we can hear uh how do I do that? Just, Nick, he, Nick, can you go ahead and answer, yeah. answer your question? Oh, there Scott, thanks for a great talk. Um, I just, it's not a, a, a question, it's a comment and it's a little story is, I was attending a, a, a graduation here at Texas A&M, a commencement, and they have this little room where, where you can go down and uh, because the commencements last forever, you can go down and get a snack. I went down there and there was a guy there who had three stars in his shoulder and he was from the Air Force. And he was obviously an Aggie because he was there. And I asked him, what did, what did he do? And he said, well, I was the ranking military member of the NRO. And I said, oh, really? Interesting. And then he, and then he asked me who I was. And I said, an astronomer. And I said, oh, he said, oh, astronomy. Yeah, well, we know all about that in NRO. And then he started telling me about the FIA program, which I'd never heard of before, which is the program that is, that is uh, donating the mirror to 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 the to this particular mission so in a in an interesting sense there's an aggie uh angle to the making of this mission in that it was the ranking military officer who graduated from texas a m university that was the person who i guess was involved in the decision to let the mirror uh go out of the nro from its you know behind the veil of secrecy and give it to nasa that's great to know thank you texas a and <laughs> i'm so glad i came and gave a talk here i know that's great that's great no, we were literally told by the project we're not supposed to say where it came from, even though it's on web pages everywhere. So. Really? Okay. <laughs> so they had set. They had. This was the sixth and seventh. I understand. As I understand. Yeah. Something like that. The sixth and seventh telescope, and you know, maybe they wanted to do something bigger. I don't know. There are reasons that JWST unfolded for us. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. That was a low risk item, which I found amazing. I mean, there's a reason it was low risk, and it's it, nobody has that in before. That's just speculation on my part. Mm -hmm. The sixth and seventh, I, I think, is correct, though. Any other questions? I would just like to finish by saying you know, long ago when you were a young graduate student, we started doing gravitational microlensing. 
It was way cruder than this. That's all I have to say. I, I had people tell me as a graduate student that I was wasting my career and microlensing would never find any planets. Yeah. I didn't say that. No, not no, you. No. 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 Anyway, Darren. Let's uh, let's thank Scott again for being here.